I'm Daniel Hewn. I'm the writer, director, producer, and one of the actors on East Bay. So, uh, before we dive into this film, I'd, I'd love to ask about... Um, Gosh, where where did this idea come from? Where did it stem from? Because it it seems very personal, but it also seems like it could be a made up version of a character. Like, where did you get this kind of idea? I made a my first feature was called Post Concussion, and it did really well in the festival circuit. This was a long time ago. It won awards and got distribution, and it was about a, a partially autobiographical story about a guy who gets a head injury and his life changes and he can't do the things he used to do, and somehow he you know as the genre would have it, becomes a much better person and learns humility and it's a new kind of success. And then it really, the film did well as I mentioned, but it bugged me because it's it's phony. Uh, not just on a personal level, but I feel like so many films have to have this narrative where we triumph over adversity, There's everything happens for a reason, everything is okay, life is beautiful and we succeed no matter what. And I thought, you know, that, that's a kind of typical feel-good movie. And those movies actually just make me feel bad. Uh, and I wanted to have a, a film where we didn't do that, but not go so dark that it was, it just made you feel like, oh God, I want to end it all. Um, and at the main, I wanted to have the main character try to figure this out for himself. And so, Road East Bay. Do you know Constance? How did you get Constance involved in some of these other cast members? I mean, but obviously with her name, she stands out. So how did you get her on board with this wonderful project? It was be this was her first feature as a lead actress. And that tells you we filmed a long time ago before uh, Fresh Off the Boat, before Crazy Rich Asians. And uh, we just found her the way people find actors through, uh, I can't remember the name of the service, but she was, she showed up for the audition and she was amazing. Wow. Yeah, she's great in this. I love that. Um, so you really were a quality hockey player, varsity level hockey player from what I understand in high school? Uh, I played high school varsity and junior varsity in college, but I'm, I mean, I, I can play hockey, but this is not like a at a, any kind of real You're still pretty good out there. I like the hockey sequences in the film. I thought oh, you held your own. Thanks. Um, Do you play hockey? Are you into hockey? Or? I mean, I followed. I mean, I live in Texas, so we, I didn't get to play too much growing up. But yeah. I'm definitely a hockey fan, yeah. I love oh, cool. I love the hockey scenes. Are you a fan of the stars? or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Oh, cool. Um, how much fun, though, was it to to add that into the film? Like, I, I love those sequences. I thought it was so much fun to see those guys. And it, it the rapport between people, it, there's so much going on in those scenes. Oh, thanks. Uh, I love hockey. And I, that game, that kind of game, shinny hockey, it's, it's to me, it's the funnest thing in the world. It really is. And I just, it's such a big part of my life and the life of several of my friends. And I just wanted it to be in a film, mm. and so we, we did it. And that, actually, it was really hard to film just because it was December and it was really, really cold outside, which means it's really cold inside yeah. the rink. And we were <laughs> we were cold, and it's, it's hard to film when it's cold. Yeah. So yeah. So another element of the film I absolutely love. The parents in this are incredible. I'm curious, are they based on your parents, or where did their these characters, this this idea of these two lovable folks, and especially, I think one of my favorite lines is uh, the dad characters. You you ask him something or about like, do you want some food, and he's like, no thanks, but I'll take some grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> like I love the way they treat you in this film. Right. It's so. I felt that pressure. I think other people have felt that pressure. How much fun was it writing their perspective? I wish I had done a better job of writing their perspective, actually. I felt like I got part of it, but mostly from the main character's point of view, mm -hmm. from his interactions with his parents, and less I would have wanted more from to see life from their perspective, and I wish I had done that. But those actually were my parents in the film, and part of their story in that film is true. Uh, part of it was not. But uh, I mean, they, the part in terms of you know, having survived uh, the Japanese occupation of Korea, then World War II, then the Korean War, the devastation that followed that, then coming here penniless and trying to make a go of it. And um, yeah, that's all true. And it's just obviously pretty common to the immigrant experience. How important is it to that be a part of your story? Because I know that's really, I mean, 
I was born in Israel. My parents are South African. They've South Africa, Israel, America, same, same, oh, wow. maybe not the wars and internment, but certainly just chaos and not having anything when you come to America, I think is something that there's so many of those stories. The universality of that, how, how have you felt audiences have reacted to that or how do you hope audiences because I thought that immediately brought me in mm. those interactions I was mm. like I know exactly what he's going through and I get why it's tough because you can't r- go to those parents and say I've had it tougher than you you know they've had it tougher than you but you also want to live your life and I, I love that dichotomy well I, I I love the way you just put that actually we should, <laughs> we should sit here <laughs> no thank you uh Man, um, it, yeah, it's, man, can you even ask me, no, I'm totally thrown, can you ask me the question again? Yeah, um, how important is telling an immigrant story and knowing that you're going to reach other people than maybe just a yeah. small snippet? I think it, it's cool if it re- reaches people. I mean, this is actually the world premiere of the film, and mm-hmm. so no one has seen it yet, and I have no idea how people will react to the film as a whole. I, I think people will identify with the, the immigrant aspect of it, and at the same time, it's I, I, I feel very cautious about making too much of it just because it's a topic that's been explored so heavily by so many films and I feel almost like when you make an Asian American film like any sort of hyphenated film you're expected to tow a certain line in terms of what the main message of the film is and that's often either a searing portrait of racial injustice or feel-good movie about underdog immigrants who come up and make good in this country by being role models in every possible way or I mean something like that and I don't I don't want to put my parents or the immigrant experience into that kind of a box I just want them to be themselves and for each story to be you know unique which is which is what they are every every family story is unique so I'm, I'm curious as far as I love titles in films. I love how people get to their titles. Why East Bay? Obviously Oakland, but why that title? Why did that stick with you? It didn't really, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> the original working title for years was Low Budget Ethnic Movie. And I liked that title, I mean, because it's quite honest. Um, and then Constance Wu became a big star, and then my friends and I figured, what should we do? Oh, we'll call it Wu, what, where, why, when? Um, and then, <laughs> and then, but the, the problem persisted. What should we call this movie? The low budget ethnic movie felt so polarizing. And my parents, uh, my father in particular, just that he didn't like it. It just felt like it was too self deprecating. And so we struggled and we came up with East Bay. And it's, and it's the main appeal of it is that it's neutral mm. and that it happens in this place. I mean, a lot of the kinds of interactions are, are kind of. I don't, I don't want to say unique, but they're they're at least maybe a little bit unique to the East Bay, the kinds of attitudes that are in the film. So There's some amazing camera choices, some amazing shots. Uh, drone work is really unique in the way you use the drone to showcase your character at the very beginning, for instance. Um, can you talk about the visual feel and what you wanted to capture and, and using different things, putting your your character as someone using the material, but also, you know, you filming the other things as a film crew. I, the visual language of the film is unique and different. Oh, thanks. Um, as a as a small budget independent film, you know, you're trying to maximize everything you can without having a huge budget for sets, really. And that often means outside, and the Bay Area is so beautiful, and we try to do as much as we can outside. and. Uh, it also means that if you're in a larger space that you can't decorate or don't have time to decorate, you try to focus on uh, close-ups more. Mm. And uh, we shot so long ago that people were just starting to use uh, uh, DSLR cameras for feature. And we shot this on a Canon 7D, and it was very easy with handheld. And so that just made sense to do it that way. And um, I like the handheld feel of it. Did that impact where the story went because you I feel like you use the canon all the time there's a lot of handheld in this movie yeah it's almost all handheld yeah yeah how did that change did it change anything of your of your script and and your shooting schedule or did you build that into it the whole time I think it allowed us to shoot places that we wouldn't have been able to shoot otherwise just because it was 
like we shot on the Bay Area Rapid Transit, the mm -hmm. local local train, and we didn't have a permit, and it was okay. We we just got in there, we did it, we're done. Uh, we had the camera on the car, and other, we, otherwise we'd have to get a, a uh, rig, a, yeah. yeah, rig in front. But this we just used a suction cup mount for the the seven D, and so it just gave us more flexibility. So cool. Um, yeah. Uh, how long was this shoot? How long? I mean, I know the editing process was a long time, but yes. how much uh, actual footage, shooting footage, you have? I know, I'm not sure. It's a lot, though. Um, the, the principal photography took place in 2010, and I think we shot at least 40 or 50 days, mm -hmm. and then we shot at least 30 or 40 days after that. And um, for a small film, that's a huge amount of time. So late summer or fall, even. It was main part of the summer in 2010, and then we went into the fall, and, yeah. then, and then we shot just a whole bunch of stuff you know, sporadically over the next few years. Did you shoot all the, especially the, the stuff that we see at the beginning, is that the first footage you have, like the drone shots at the beginning with you, or what was kind of the, the, the order you had this? The film got remade in editing. That drone footage was shot much after. The, okay. Yeah, and the, the character's opening monologue actually was uh, written much later than the original script. Wow. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so there's little things in the film I want to ask you about that because I, I, there were certain things that made me crack up and giggle. Oh. Um, when he smokes out of the... Uh, the honey, the bear honey thing. Yeah. Is that a real pipe? Like, can you find that? Did you build that? What the hell is that? That no, was hilarious. That's, that's, that's an homage to True Romance. Uh, yes. Tarantino's yeah. Brad Pitt's character smoking out of a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really wanted that. And so we found it online. I'm so glad you brought the reference. That was, that was <laughs> I was like, I know I've seen this. And oh, okay. So cool. <laughs> uh, are there any other missed references? What other filmmakers inspired uh, some of the shot choices? Man, I can't even... My brain's not even in that space right now. Um, the overall look of the film—I I really, I was enjoying the film or the TV series Friday Night Light, Friday Night Lights, if you can believe it, before shooting, and they use the same similar style. Mm -hmm. They use a few wides, and then they use a handheld zoom, and then they—they'll do a pop zoom sometimes. And I thought, man, we can we can pull that off um, with the Canon, and we can—it gives the film a style without needing a, a huge crew to move the camera. And so, uh, for I mean, that was that was a nice, uh, I guess, stroke of luck there. Hmm. World premiere here at Tallgrass. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to wanting this film at this festival? It's, uh, I mean, twenty years strong. A, it's a it's a long running festival. That's not necessarily the case. So especially with what COVID did to a lot of festivals. Um, but it isn't one that is a distributor. It's based on audiences getting to see this and, and filmmakers coming together. Um, what made you want to come here? I hadn't heard of it a few years ago, and then several filmmaker friends told me about it, and they said, this is a special festival. And I could tell they really actually respected it. Uh, they respected the people who run it. They respected how things got done here, just the basic the values of the festival, which I think is it's about serving the community it's about promoting the arts it's about supporting filmmakers and there was an honesty about it I, that's that was the the really strong impression i got from other filmmakers and i just thought well it's great and the timing worked out so uh, I'm, i feel really lucky to be here so you know i'm a stars fan who's your hockey fan team oh <laughs> I grew up in Toronto, and unfortunately for oh. our hockey, yeah. So we're just the last. I, I've actually my friends and I have worn paper bags over our heads the last few years when the Leafs have exited the playoffs. <laughs> the least, last time they were good it was like Matt Sundin was twelve or something. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, sixty-seven. 67 <laughs> Dallas Stars won one or two cups. I can't remember. I think uh, two. We've we've won the two, but they've been separated by distance. Yeah. yeah Darian Hatcher was captain. When, yes. Yeah. And then Mike Madonna 99. was there, Eddie Belfour. Yeah. That was a great team. Joe Neuendijk was there. Yeah, we beat, uh, that was Buffalo we faced when yeah, Buffalo had that. Yeah. Dominic. Oh, yeah, God, he's so good. Yeah. Um, I think we just talk hockey the whole time. Yeah, no, I like to. <laughs> Honestly, it's more relaxing. So, yeah. As, since this project took forever, I know it's a very personal project, but what can we expect you next like what other projects what other stories you're working on? i'm sure you have more that is coming down the line for us 
I've been working on a couple of scripts, but actually what I would like to say about this film is uh, the main character, as I mentioned earlier about the idea of the success and failure and, and triumphing, triumphing over adversity, and this character who chooses not to do that and s therefore struggles with this, this problem, like how can you be happy and successful when you're deliberately not trying to be, or trying not to be happy and successful? And what you end up with is with a, a passive character who is constantly in conflict with himself. And editing that film for all this time, seeing myself being this miserable person, I think it had a big effect on me, actually. I started seeing myself as that character without even realizing it. Uh, and I think people who saw the film who didn't know me well started seeing me that way, way too. And so just to get out from under this film is is a huge... I feel free. <laughs> I feel free to not be this... not have to face this version of myself who I am not. Um, this character who I've, I gave myself over to. Um, I'm glad I don't have to be that person anymore. So... So this was cathartic. Well, finishing, finishing is sure cathartic, for sure. Just as like I'm here at the Telegrass Film Festival having the world premiere. So my film, that means, that must mean the film is done. So <laughs> that's great. I love that kind of thing. Yeah. It might be done. <laughs> um, as far as getting to see like something happen with like Constance about seeing an actor rise from it, how much... For, for the for for the for the culture, but also for to see one of your actors do something like that. How, how much pride do you have in seeing the success she has, and and that may obviously come back and impact the film for the positive, just because of now that name recognition. But it must be really cool to see, you know, everything that's happened with her. Yeah, I, it's it's cool. And I'll, actually, when we were filming, we thought there are three actors on this who we think are one one film or TV show away from being superstars, and she was one of them for sure. Uh, you, she was so professional. She's obviously incredibly talented. Uh, she's a really hard worker. We we were such a low-budget film, like, actors had to bring their own costumes and do their own hair and makeup, and she did. She didn't complain once. Um, and it's not surprising to see all of her success now. Uh, I'm definitely, I mean, the whole the casting crew are really happy for her. I think she well she deserves it so well Daniel thank you for finishing the film first of all taking the time to finish it but to bring it to Tallgrass I love seeing this film here and I really enjoyed it. I'm probably one of the few people who've gotten to see it that's true um, but I, I, I laugh throughout once again the the smoking thing all of his smoking scenes spot on I loved him he was <laughs> that, that character yes I want that character in he's a movie. awesome yeah. um, but thank you for coming to Tallgrass and, and Daniel it's, it's been a pleasure oh thank you so much I really appreciate it